Hi everyone and welcome over here on the Glissa platform uh, for today's event. Um, hope to bring to you um, uh, a number of interesting uh, ideas, food for thought uh, as you're thinking about running virtual or, or hybrid events over the next few months at least. Um, I'm joined by uh, my guest Steve uh, from Mantis Broadcast who will be picking up um, the second half of the, of the session um, where we'll be looking at uh, video components and so on. Um, but first of all, we're going to be looking at the um, ideas around interaction for virtual events. Um, so if you're not familiar with the Glissa platform, um, up there, I think it's that side. Does that look right? Yep, up there, that's where you're going to see the lights live sharing. So in our platform, there is no need for the presenters to share slides directly by screen sharing. They're all produced neatly up in that direction. Just below there, you can see the slides as they come through in a slide sorter. Um, there is an option for Q&A or, or interaction. You can take notes and you can also download the slides there. Um, but one of the first things I'd like everyone to do on that side is just to click onto the Q&A option and to just type in um, which country or which city you're joining us from, just so we can start to see a few of those names coming through. And we can start to think that actually there's a group of us here, um, more than just um, a few of us sitting in our houses, but we're all spread around the world and we're all interacting. So we're creating this, uh, this gathering together. Um, so as they start coming through, um, we'll, we'll see them appear. Um, you can say hello to each other. Uh, and I'll start off on the session. So today's session, um, we're really going to talk about um, taking a virtual event to the next level. Um, in my mind, and this is something that we've been speaking about a lot for the last um, the last few months, there's something fundamental that I think you need within a virtual event. And I've really driven this down into three main areas. Um, the first thing that I think you need to do is do things that are live. So we're doing that right now. Um, if you don't do something live, you may as well just pre-record and put it on YouTube so that people consume at their leisure. The whole point about running an event is creating a single gathering where people are there together. Now, they might not be there physically, but they can be there virtually and they need to participate at the same time. The second piece, and relates to participation, is making those sessions as interactive as possible. So if, if we don't make sessions interactive, you may as well just um, just simply record them. You may as well have done the YouTube idea because it's just as easy to run this video and practice it and redo it and get it right than it is to run it live. So the whole point of having a live session is that you as an audience can participate. Uh, and you can get involved, you can offer your opinions, you can engage, um, you can contribute so that we're using hundreds, thousands of brains simultaneously to contribute to the debate and make something interesting rather than just the presenter. So with that in mind, when we clear the Q&A uh, of all of the places that you, you've jotted down, um, I'm going to invite you to ask questions through there. We've allowed at least 10 minutes at the end for questions. Um, and, and if relevant, we'll bring some of them up through the, the middle of the session as well. My part of the presentation is going to be talking about interactivity. The second half of the presentation um, from, our, from our partners at Mantis will be talking about video. So I think right now it's fundamental that we include a video component in virtual events. Um, we're all stuck at home. There's a lot of restrictions about the people that we can have face-to-face -face time with. And so I think for the sake of our humanity, we need to see each other. We need to get a feel that there's a person at the other end of, of the computer and actually create a, a, a true interaction. So we've all been using Zoom. We've all been using Blue Jeans. We've all been using the various platforms to, to do this over the last month or so. And we found them to be really valuable socially as well as um, for business purposes. Um, but we're going to talk to, to, to the guys at Mantis about taking it to the next level. So how do you go beyond a simple Zoom meeting? How do you go beyond it in terms of the video production levels, the things that you can do and the way that you can smooth out some of the some of the creaks and cracks um, with any of those tools? So that's really the agenda for the session. Um, looking to run it in about a half an hour. The other piece that I want to talk about is, is the discussion between virtual and hybrid. And we've come out quite strongly saying that we believe that the hybrid meetings are the way forward. We have a view that um, lockdown will gradually ease rather than a big bang. Uh, and a number of factors will drive towards um, a preference for, for hybrid meetings. So by hybrid, I mean that there will be some people in a room, probably in limited numbers, and then some people virtually. So the situation we have at the moment is 
with almost totally virtual. It's very rare that anybody is in the same space. The, the, perhaps the only time you do it is if, say, a husband and wife team are presenting at the same time from, from their house, because it's rare that the, the people required for your event are cohabiting, so allowed to be in the same room. So you've got this, this concept of completely virtual. The presenters are virtual, the audience is virtual, the moderators are virtual, and there's no support from the kind of AV technicians that you would normally have in a real life event. When you look at a hybrid scenario, the presenters are more likely to be in the room. It, it's likely that your senior leaders or your talent, whatever you want to call them, are going to be able to get to a space where there is limited ability to, to spend time with each other. You also start to see audiences being able to attend. And no doubt the venues and facilities that have, that have not been able to run events for the last month or so are going to want to do that. And if it's going to mean reduced numbers, restrictions around sanitization, spacing, distancing, all of those things, it will happen, but it will just mean that the, the size of those meetings are going to be much smaller. And so as a result, in order to fill that gap, you're going to have to start looking at uh, a virtual mix into that, which creates a hybrid event. You may be able to get your hosts into the room, your moderators, and Hopefully, you'll be able to get some in-room in support, which makes the kind of the concept of creating and driving the video much easier because the professionals will be close to the presenters um, and just solving one of the one of the challenges that we're seeing in virtual right now. But whilst we are in this pure virtual situation, and as we move into the hybrid kind of world. That's why we've brought on partners like Mantis, who are video technicians, who are able to provide you that comfort factor um, when they're not in the room standing next to your presenters. One thing I do want to reiterate is that I don't think the event, the, the reasons for running events change at all um, in, a, in a virtual or a hybrid situation. We've always broken them down into these four main areas. You're running events to generate business. You're running events to build a brand value or to, to activate a brand. You're running events to teach people, to inform, to train, um, to help them learn, to pass on information, or you're running events to create connections and network working opportunities. And you might be running these things in all sorts of combinations. Um, one's normally priority and the others are secondary and so on. But, but ultimately, the same principle applies to virtual events. So when you're starting to design your virtual event, you go back to those objectives right at the start, and that determines whether you want to run a virtual or hybrid event, and then how you might deliver it. And then finally, do you start thinking about the technology that you, that you might want to deploy? The other thing to note, though, is that despite the ultimate objectives not really changing, you really should be thinking about your formats changing. So there's a couple of, of things in play here. You're no longer constrained by the physical space, so you no longer can only have as many delegates as you can fit into the room that you've booked. And similarly, you're no longer constrained by the time that you've got that room booked for. So in theory, you could have an infinite number of delegates and you could run your event for an infinite amount of time because that's not constraining you anymore. Many physical events, you, you determine the space you have and that's how many guests you can get. And if you have to book that venue by the day, you tend to create an event that runs a full day, even if the information could be passed on in two hours. With the virtual, uh, with a virtual event, you don't have those limits. So you've got to start, you, you, know, you can do whatever you want, but you've got to make sure that it works. You also have the problems. With more distractions, it's very easy to walk away. Um, I don't know whether this ac goes across all cultures, but certainly as a Brit, if I'm halfway through a presentation session, unless I'm sitting right at the back, um, I usually sit and watch the whole thing, even if I'm not interested. Um, that doesn't apply in a virtual event. Someone can navigate at any time as, as soon as you lose their attention. Um, so you've got to you've got to control that. What we're seeing is that means better, better designed, shorter, punchier sessions. Um, and in particular, thinking about increasing the variation in session types. So it's very difficult to hold someone's attention in a physical environment for four hours of PowerPoint. Um, certainly, a, you know, a full school day was more than enough for me, um, but that was with break time. So you've got to you've got to make sure that you create that variation. You've got to create those informal sessions, even if it's not something that you've perhaps been used to. Um, and so we're going to we're going to talk about that um, very shortly. You've also got to create that constant audience participation. So you'll notice that once I start going into the session, there's going to be a lot more interactions and polls to vote in and so on. It's really important that you keep touching back to those audience participation elements just to make sure they're still there, make sure they're listening, make sure they haven't navigated away to, to, to look at someone else and just listening to you on speaker. Um, as I said, 
that informal kind of low intensity areas allow people to get that break from the straightforward presentation sessions. And then finally, um, it's really important to think about your virtual audience, particularly actually when you move towards a hybrid scenario, add value for them. Don't let them be sort of second class citizens. Um, just because they're not in the room, that means you can actually potentially give them more. You can do some more creative things that are dedicated just for them. So think about that. Um, in terms of those sort of ideas that we've had around different sessions to, to increase engagement, um, a few that we've been talking through with clients that I think are, are quite interesting. Um, we've been talking around the concept of kind of a breakout or coffee area. So you create within your event uh, a space that people can navigate to at any time. And in that, there's a, there's a Zoom meeting pulling through or another, another interactive meeting that they can drop in and out of at their leisure. So you create this kind of virtual coffee area where people just might make a connection, bump into someone, start talking to someone that looks interesting and maybe go off and, and have, have a one-to-one -one connection off the back of that. Um, you can also do the same with sponsor areas. So just as you, you might sell sponsor booths, Within your, within your physical event, you can do that within a virtual event, within the Glissa platform, for example, create sponsor areas. They could be connected to video conference calls and people are able to kind of drop into those at their leisure. They can participate and speak to the, speak to the speakers between sessions. They might complete a survey or qualification session for the speaker. They might be able to download literature. So you start to build up these alternatives that are straightforward presentations. So it begins to feel more than just like a straightforward webinar, but actually more like a like an event. And similarly, you can do things with, with speakers. So pre-record speakers talking about what themselves, what they're gonna be speaking about, what time they're on, starting to use the media opportunities that you have um, to create something that's a little bit more discoverable. Uh, it's not just a single stream structure where you're going through the flow driven by someone else setting up an agenda, but there's areas where you can break out, you can go and do different things. You can kind of take a break from, from listening to, to content where you're learning things to doing things that's more about the, the networking um so that's a that's a kind of an important thing that we're seeing but i'm, I'm just going to give you a, a few examples of some of the kind of interactive interactivity that we can offer in terms of um our platform um we can do live polling so you can see um, a live poll now appearing on the screen um just a quick question you'll see that polling is quite common in physical events you can you can run it across into a virtual or a, a, a hybrid event um, the really nice thing about this is that when you're doing this in a in a virtual event like this, um, you're actually able to combine um, the information from delegates in the room and delegates um, who are interacting virtually. So all of that data can come through. We can do a live show. I can now see the results. I can push them to you as well. So I'm able to, um, to share those to my audience. You're able to, to kind of interact. If we were in a physical space, they would be projected up onto the big screen. And the people who voted virtually would get the same level of vote as the people in the room. So it'd feel like they were totally engaged and, and, and contributing to the discussion through the things that they're, they're voting on. Um, you'll see there that was, whilst that was considered a poll, I was actually kind of data gathering. So you can start to think about how that might be useful for your sponsors. Um, in this case, you know, I've asked you, do you think you're going to be running a virtual event as a, as a, as a platform that, that offers virtual and, and hybrid events? That's interesting data to us. Um, might be useful to think about using polls, not just for a bit of fun, but actually to use them to gather useful information um, for your event or your business. We can also set up quizzes. So in the same way, we can um, we can run these um, these sessions as live quizzes. Um, in this case, I allocate a right answer, and I can tell you that eighty one percent of you have got that one right. So we can start to then generate leaderboards off the back of this. You're adding a layer of gamification. Um, you can run those gamification sessions across an event or across a session. Um, you can start to give rewards out for for people um, voting correctly or incorrectly in there. So you can start to you can start to engage the audience and, and, and build upon that. Um, the next thing we do so we have obviously have other formats. So we can run in this case. This is a rating question. Um, Whilst these are commonly used for things like um, feedback, gathering, surveys, and so on, rate the presenters, rate the session, rate the coffee, rate the venue, rate everything, 
Um, there's actually more interesting ways to use them, I think, and this is the kind of approach we've taken here. So this is more of what, what we would call like a Likert scale. So you can start to look at two ends of a spectrum and seeing whether uh, where people fit within that kind of that field. And that's quite useful information that we can start to see. Um, and again, the data that we can gather from doing something like this um, is exactly exactly the sort of thing that might be useful to, to sponsors. Coming to the end of my session, but the last thing that, that we can do is also run um, what we call a lottery. So whilst we're running a lottery here, I can see all of the names that you've dropped in um, and they are running through and it's basically taking everyone's name who's participating right now. And I can just hit a button and present a winner. And I'm pleased to say that uh, Tomomi has won a free Glissa entry license. You can see that sort of thing being used um, to do prize givings and prize draws, but at the same time, I could use this technique um, to maybe uh, select a user and ask them to contribute to the debate. So we're starting to use the different functionalities in different ways um, and trying to just use them throughout a session. I've just obviously run through a load in a row really quickly, um, but you can start to run these sessions to, to, make, them, to make them more engaging. Um, before I hand over to, to Steve uh, over at Mantis, um, I've noticed I can see the question feed coming in. Um, there's a couple of questions that are relevant right now, so I'm going to pick them up rather than wait to the end. Yep, the slides are available after the presentation. If you look again, I'm trying to get my angles right. If you look there, um, there's a button that says download. Um, and if you tap in your email address there, you'll be able to download the slide deck. Um, and if you ever want to zoom in on the slides, you can just tap the slides um, and zoom in and, and they will go large and then tap them again and they will go small. So you can zoom in on the, all the important, important content that's available there. Um, but with that, um, we'll do take some more questions at the end. But first, I'd like to introduce uh, uh, Steve, Steve Tinsley um, over at um, Mantis. And Hi, Mike. What's Hi, Steve. Uh, hey, Steve. How are you doing? Yeah, fine, thanks. How are yeah. you? Yeah, good. I'm trying to keep to time, but I always run a little bit over. Oh, don't worry. Don't worry. Cool. So just to introduce Steve. So Steve is one of the, um, the video partners that we work with. Um, and we work with them with some of our larger clients, and we're introducing them more and more um, to just really add that sheen to um, the video element of these sessions. Um, they're going to show you some of the things that, that they can do. Um, we're running this all live. Um, and, and before we sort of talk, before I hand over fully, it's worth saying that one of the really nice things that I've experienced as a presenter here is that, is that Steve's partner, Stuart, is talking in my ear the whole time, giving me the countdowns to the videos and so on. And that, as a presenter, that experience is just so comforting. It feels like um, I've got someone who's really controlling things on my behalf. Um, I can worry about my content. I can worry about my presentation. I can worry about running my polls. And I've kind of known that, that everything else is being taken care of. So first of all, thanks for that. But but I'm going to hand over for you, to you guys to um, show us what you can do. Great. Well, thanks, Mike. Um, so as, you, as you're probably aware, virtual conferencing technology has been around, around for many years. Um, but what, what we have now is the facility to join in from our home offices uh, and offices without the need for setting up large satellite dishes and complex technology. Uh, the studios, which are manned by producers and technicians such as myself, uh, have a much more compact remote setup, but we can still create television style quality programming for these virtual events. One area which has become much more important, I think, uh, with the virtual events is the pre-production time. Uh, what I mean by this is spending time with each presenter, each location, each site, to make sure their setup is the best it can be. Um, testing their internet connection, making sure it's good enough, uh, making sure their camera uh, is, uh, has the best shot possible, uh, making sure the audio is clear. Uh, all of these things we do to make sure the presenter doesn't have to worry about them on the day. Um, you know, that, that their most important thing on the day needs to be uh, their message they need to deliver. If during the testing we find that perhaps the internet isn't good enough uh, at a particular location, then we could work with the presenter to pre-record uh, their content. Um, so they could do some screen sharing uh, and deliver us the file remotely. We could then edit that into a, uh, uh, a video which we can play back with, you know, a re ready to go presentation, uh, taking away the risk of their internet uh, dropping. Um, uh, we also have the facility to bring in uh, that presenter perhaps via a telephone line. So if their internet is that poor, uh, we could play out their 
presentation uh, that they have pre-recorded and then bring them in via the telephone to answer any questions. So that enables us to, uh, you know, still get them involved. Um, so that's, you know, that, that works really well. Um, to join together everything, uh, we obviously utilize current video conferencing platforms. Uh, at Mantis Broadcast, we are agnostic. So, uh, you know, what that means is we are, uh, we can use whatever conferencing system you like, uh, be it Skype, Zoom, Microsoft Teams, BlueJeans, you know, we can integrate with it. Uh, in our remote studios, uh, we, uh, we then produce the virtual event into the live stream uh, and deliver it out on a reliable content delivery network. Um, and they are such uh, things such as YouTube, Facebook, Vimeo, Wowza, um, which enable hundreds, thousands of people to connect to. Uh, in this scenario, you've probably seen we're using YouTube. Um, you know, the scalability of that system is as, as probably the biggest you'll get out there. So let's have a quick look about what we're talking about here. Uh, just to clarify, uh, I'm talking to you, or uh, myself and Mike are talking to you on a standard Skype call. Um, but within the call, we've got a few more bells and whistles. So uh, you know, we're able to use the client branding. Uh, we're using Gliss's colors and Gliss's logo, you can see top right. Um, we can also create uh, animated custom lower thirds uh, with names and titles, just like you can see below me now. Uh, these little additions and flares of production turn a standard conference call into uh, a professional broadcast. Um, this is what people come to expect these days. Um, someone said to me the other day, you know, uh, in, in these days of Twitch and YouTube bloggers, even our children are expecting these high levels of production. Um, so, you know, it works really well. Um, so, as I say, we were able to play back uh, video content uh, through in, in full frame and high definition through the stream. Uh, I've got a short YouTube clip here just to demonstrate how we might be able to transition between a live video and the YouTube video. So that was just a short clip off YouTube, uh, just to show how we can transition from a video to uh, well, a camera to a live, uh, to, to a pre-recorded video. Um, if I can now bring back uh, Mike, uh, and I'll also introduce uh, my colleague, uh, Stu, who is actually manning the virtual studio today. Um, so, hey Stu, how you doing? Yeah, I'm very good. Uh, I'm, I'm in control of everything, as you can see, with my multiple headphones and uh, bedraggled with wires and my lovely rattan background lets you know that I'm in control of things. Uh, yes, we have, as Mike was mentioning earlier, uh, we have a thing that we like to call the virtual green room, where we can talk to the presenters offline uh, and during their presentation as well. So we can guide them through everything that's happening on the live session uh, so that they can understand what is happening in terms of uh, the audience side of things, coming out of the video clips, going into those videos, um, and uh, preparing any content necessary for that. Now, uh, my audio is uh, a little bit worry because of the amount of machines and buttons and screens that I have uh, going on around me, so uh, sorry about that. Um, but it's a necessary evil, uh, as we have lots of different elements here kind of pulling everything uh, together uh so yeah back to you steve cool and um so tell us about your studio so we've had a question here is it like a traditional studio do you have multiple preview monitors pre-rolls multiple sources is it just like a, a physical studio you'd have in, in, in any scenario yeah that's right so if you've ever been at an event and you'd normally see that big long table full of all the technicians with lots of headphones on and lots of screens in front of them um, that's essentially what I've got set up in front of me here. Um, I have uh, a graphics machine that's driving all of the uh, lower thirds, all the, you can see our names below us here. We've got the live uh, logos and everything that's, that's branded over the top. We have graphics machines that are driving that and we can work with you in designing any of these elements to look the way that you want. Uh, at the moment we have behind us, there's this gray, the, the, the lovely kind of uh, sleek 
glisser gray that we're using as our backdrop but that could be uh, motion graphics that could be a clip that could be your company's uh, branded colors uh, gradients between colors anything you like really um, and then we have machines that deal with the calling as well so if that's skype um, or Skype TX for anybody that is aware of Skype TX. We've uh, deliberately gone with the domestic version of Skype today just to demonstrate the ease of how, uh, of how we can get people into the call because everybody's heard of Skype. It's been around for a very long time. It's one of the early uh, players in this game. Um, so we're using that as a recognized brand for this session, uh, but for those that know Skype TX or Skype for Business, uh, these are you know slightly different platforms that uh, we also utilize, and we have a whole separate machine that's just for that. Um, we then have uh, uh, other machines that deal with the vision mixing. So I have controllers in front of me here that are dealing with all of the, uh, just to kind of demo that, I can take away this, and you know we have these animated um, uh, reveals that come in so um, all of the mixing as you saw as we were going from from shot to shot there the there were things that were moving and transitioning so i have a graphics machine that can mix all of these things together and then we have a uh, another machine that literally just deals with uh, taking all of that uh, that master video information and sending that up to the cloud as cleanly uh, and with lower latency as we can possibly get cool and the next highest voted question was around hybrid events and having a dedicated member of staff in the room to manage the online delegates. So I think I can I can address that, but then maybe hand over to you guys. So I think I think the um, you certainly got to uh, appreciate that you have an online audience and that there are elements that they will need to be um, receiving. Um, certainly, the the video production element will be critical to them, um, and even if you've got um, the videographers in a room making sure that, that the, the video is going out to the virtual um, delegates in the right way um, is an important part. Um, the beauty of using, say, a hybrid platform is that things like the audience Q&A, the audience polling, even the slide sharing, um, that's all integrated. So if you're doing it in the room, there's no extra tasks that are being added as a result of also having a virtual audience because the participants in the room are voting on their phones, they're asking questions via their phones, it's the same platform that's enabling the virtual audience to vote, see the slides, ask questions and so on. So from that perspective, it keeps it fairly simple. Um, but in terms of the video content, I guess you guys would say, you know, it's not just a question of getting it up onto to the web, it's making sure that it's then delivered correctly. Yeah, um, precisely that. So, um, yeah, I think we've explained the, the technical element of it. Um, we, in this scenario, Stuart is the producer, so he is bringing in myself as a remote caller and uh, Mike as a remote caller, so he would make sure that the uh, his presenter is happy um, and has what they want. Um, and if they do have any difficulties, he can talk it through with them. Um, so, yeah, I, th I think... Uh, yeah, and there's um, one element that people often forget in video, which oddly seems to be the last thing on the list, is quality audio. Uh, now again, you can probably hear a bit of whirring, but I do have lots of fans around me right now. Uh, but um, hopefully you can hear that Mike and Steve are crystal clear. Now, in a lot of cases, um, if there are video issues, reverting to audio means that we can, we've still got a presentation. We've still got content that can be delivered and the message of what people are uh, trying to say is still going to get out there, especially with the amazing tools that, um, that Glisser are using here, these, uh, these amazing uh, elements that bring everything to life. Now, if we lose a camera feed, that's one thing, but if we lose audio, we don't have a presentation anymore. And uh, to us, that's, that's a real focus for people and making sure that we have those backups in place that are not overly technical for the presenters. We don't want to have the presenters looking like me right now, covered in cables with millions of buttons and screens in front of them. It's exactly what we want to try and avoid. Uh, we want to try and make that as clean and as clear as possible, and we can take that stress away from them so that the delivery, no matter what happens during the show, the delivery uh, of that content gets to the viewers as cleanly as possible, and, uh, and most importantly, that uh, message is still intact. Yeah. And it's worth it's worth noting that you know you wouldn't normally have the technician on the call itself, um, so you, your your time is being split. You know, you normally you wouldn't be the 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 talent, let's say, and and running the show and managing those components. 
um, and, and and also worth noting that I am on Wi-Fi, much to your uh, suggestions that I shouldn't be. So if I'm fading in and out, that's my Wi-Fi, not following my own rules here. Um, we do have a question, and I think it's relevant. It's around um, the lag between video and audio. So what causes that? And what do you guys have as like a recommendation for for solving that? So I guess we're experiencing a little bit of it here. What's the what's the normal what's the normal cause of that so that people can learn from this? Do you want me to take that, Stu? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I'll, I'll fill in if there's anything else. Yeah. So um, uh, Skype is nearly real time. There's a few milliseconds. So you know, let's call that real time. Uh, we then ingest that into our vision mixer which again will add a few milliseconds, so we're still in real time. We then deliver it through a CDN. Um, in this scenario, it's YouTube. Um, what YouTube does is it re-encodes it into multiple bit rates. Uh, so uh, essentially that means if you've got a slow internet connection, it will drop the quality to carry on playing for you. Uh, now that takes time. Um, fairly recently, um, YouTube has enabled us to do uh, an ultra low latency stream, which means I think from last looking, we were about four or five seconds delayed. So they are doing that conversion very quickly and delivering it to within about five seconds. Now, there are lots of other platforms that um, might have longer delays than that. Um, you know, an average on some of the other older platforms might be more like 20 seconds. Um, so that has to be taken into account when using perhaps the Glissa platform to do the voting. But as long as you're aware of that, I think, you know, you can work with that and ask the question and then carry on talking about the subject and look at the answers a minute later. Um, I, don't, I don't think that really affects the event, but it's, it's just bearing in mind, unfortunately, with the, the power of the internet, um, things do take time to get ready to be delivered to tens of thousands of people, if that's what it was. Um, if, yeah, that, that's, uh, yeah we, we're kind of stuck with that at the moment um, in, a, you know, in, a, in a simple delivery network. Um, yeah, I, I've got a couple of little details there. Um, I think there was something specific in the question about the relationship between video and audio as well. Um, and we have uh, what we call uh, AV delay units. So we can sync up uh, audio and video. So for example, if somebody in their home setup may have a, you know, a beautiful camera, a DSLR or something like that with a nice ring light on it, and they use their iPhone for the audio, those technologies are going through two very different paths in order to reach the same spot and here at the studio what we can do is delay those two and 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 sync them up before they go into the mixer and then ultimately out onto the stream um, the the last point uh, that i wanted to throw in there is the difference between video conferencing and content delivery networking um, they're two very different things um, uh, video conferencing software is designed for real-time communication backwards and forwards and they have some very interesting uh, audio algorithms that allow people to talk over each other without cancelling each other out too much. I think we've all experienced this with our family members, especially recently when you're trying to ask a question when uh, one of our other family members is telling a long story and we're trying to interrupt with a question, oh then what happened there and they don't hear us. Uh, we've all experienced that kind of thing. Um, those kind of issues are the payoff that you get for that real-time conversation backwards and forwards with absolutely no delay. You also get a reduction in quality because uh, the video and the audio is incredibly compressed uh, and their priority, things like, uh, so just to be clear, I'm talking about Zoom or Teams as opposed to Vimeo or YouTube. Vimeo and YouTube are a content delivery network and uh, Zoom and Teams are a video conferencing network. The video conferencing network's priority is to make things as real time as possible, as clear as possible for people to talk over each other and communicate. Um, however, you don't always get everything for free and what you lose there is often uh, audio quality you often lose uh, video quality, uh, you drop a lot of frames, sometimes things kind of jump around a little bit from time to time, uh, but you maintain a connection and you will be able to get through that meeting, that conversation without any issues. When you start using a CDN, um, the quality raises a lot, as you saw from the videos that we've been playing during the, the presentation, 
um, the quality of the sound, the quality of the video is preserved from the camera all the way through to the delivery uh, into the people's eyes and ears that are actually watching the presentation. So um, there, there is a payoff between using video conferencing and content delivery. So I'll, uh, I'll mute my mic again. So I think I think one of the one of the nice things about them when we move towards back to back towards a hybrid scenario is that you do have that scope for obtaining the video in a professional manner with a video crew in front of all of the presenters, which eliminates perhaps one of the most challenging parts whilst it's whilst it's pure virtual. Um, you can still serve that virtual audience at scale using things like YouTube Live and Vimeo, um, but also it means you've got that, you know, that professional crew getting getting the audio and sound into in the system in the first place. Um, we're getting loads of questions. I don't know if you guys are comfortable staying on for an extra 10 minutes or so. Um, we, we're up to our scheduled time slot, but I'm, we're getting a lot of questions, so I don't, I don't see any harm in us yeah, carrying on answering them. That's okay. Um, so a kind of a practical question so behind the scenes talking to the presenter or the upcoming presenters is can you have as many people as you like is there a maximum or is it do you, do you generally see it's better for like one person to be controlling all of that what's what's the kind of setup behind the scenes i'll uh, i'll leap in on that one yeah go for it um yeah okay so in terms of multiple presenters yeah absolutely the uh when using a video conferencing system but here at the studio, we're really beholden to the limits of that platform. Uh, we don't have any uh, restrictions in terms of how many people uh, can be presenting. Um, typically, what we find is that if we have 20 presenters queued up for a three or four hour presentation, they won't be joining. I, I hate to give away the, the, the secrets here, but <laughs> most of those people don't join the call until about two minutes before they're supposed to be doing their presentation. So typically we'll only have three or four people um, in the conference, the people that are currently doing their presentation and usually the people that are about to come up next. People that are joining in two, three hours time, they will be watching the, the conference probably, or maybe, dare I say it, doing absolutely something completely different. Um, yeah. And we will have uh, other producers as well. So although I'm in one of our studios here that we've, you know, we've pilfered as much stuff as we can to reinstall it at the chagrin of my family. But um, uh, what that means is that uh, in this scenario, for example, as the engineer, the technician, um, I can concentrate on the switches and the buttons and making sure that everything's nice and clean. And if necessary, uh, uh, the producer, uh, let's say for example Steve uh, will be able to manage the calls reaching out to presenters texting them whatsapping them hey are you ready to jump on the call um, so there's there's a group effort behind the scenes which is normally that person that you'd see at an event that's gathering those presenters getting them mic'd up ready to go on stage just giving them a little chat are you comfortable is there anything you need you know that 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 person that we've all seen at events that's tying everything together that producer that's there um, that can be split across two locations. So we do have the ability to, uh, to press all the buttons and make everything work. Uh, but we also have another person that doesn't have to be in the same room as me, um, gathering together the more, uh, the stage managed side of things, which would normally be the miking up, as I said, you know, making sure that people are fed and watered before they go on stage. That can be dealt with, uh, not necessarily be by me, but one of my colleagues in another location. Cool. Um, a couple of questions here. I'm, I'm going by the most, the highest voted. So if, if there are questions in the feed that you definitely want answered, please vote them up and we'll, we'll try and do them in order. Presentation is going to be available afterwards. We're recording it. So that's, a, that's an easy one. Um, max number of attendees on the platform. Um, we've tested our platform up to 100,000 um, simulated attendees, um, which is kind of where we feel our you know, comfortable limit is, but, but we, we haven't tested further, not because we, um, we didn't think we could do it, we just kind of, that was as far as the test that we put in place. It's, it's kind of rare to see events of that size. I think it's important on the, when you're selecting your video platform to understand the limitations to numbers available there. Um, there's a number of, of free or cheap um, video conferencing platforms that allow multiple delegates and but sometimes they're restricted by numbers and certainly on the kind of main web conferencing platforms as you as you increase in numbers the pricing increases around those platforms um, there are ways so for example YouTube 
being you know, it's almost infinite in how large it can go just because it's you know owned by one of the largest companies in the world there are ways of without um, video AV technicians of pushing say for example zoom to YouTube um, that is possible there is a button on zoom to just push it up and so you that combines um, a, a, a zoom multiple presenters with uh, the the size of a YouTube feed um, once you figured out how to do it but then obviously using using professionals like Stephen Stewart you're able to combine multiple inputs and then select the best output so it really gives you that flexibility and sort of taken off of your taken off of your hands um, also in terms of scaling um, maximum sort of consecutive sessions um, I th the, there isn't the technically isn't a limit um, the limit is more you know how sensible that would be um, I think large conferences you can have 20 30 tracks running simultaneously um, that feels like a lot for a virtual event um, you're you're trying to you know, you're going to be the complexity i think of a virtual event probably goes up in line with the number of presenters because i think as we've seen some of the challenges of bringing through the presenter feed explaining how what they've got to do their role within it and once you scale the number of presenters with more and more simultaneous sessions you're just increasing that complexity and also if you're running them simultaneously that means you're potentially going to need video support on simultaneous sessions rather than running them kind of one after the other. Um, what I do think you can do is run some of those alternative styles of sessions, you know, breakout rooms and so on simultaneously and try and construct an event like that. Back to the point around timing, I don't think presentations need to be as long anymore. You can keep them short and sharp. Perhaps the Q&A session will run on, but the, but the presentation content doesn't, doesn't need to. Um, let's look, I'll see if I can find a question for you guys. Um, thoughts just using Z Z Zoom on its own, have you, what, what, how would you, how would you explain to an, to an event planner, why don't, why don't we just use Zoom? What, why, why, why would we look at, say, a more professional looking opportunity? Um, so, uh, as you said, Zoom, it is more than possible to push a Zoom call straight to YouTube. Um, but there's, the, you've got no control over uh, or very fiddly control, I should say, over who is center screen, um, how to show the gallery view. Uh, the, the quality tends to be not quite as good. Um, so uh, I, I guess, in, you know, really it's, 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 it's the fiddliness of using Zoom is not very straightforward. Um, if we were to use Zoom to broadcast a slightly more professional system, we'd have uh, multiple uh, multiple computers playing back in the same Zoom call, so that we could take full screen of each presenter uh, and then mix it into a nice TV style show uh, to make it look seamless. Uh, if we were to just use Zoom, you'd then have the Zoom branding somewhere, and and you wouldn't be able to switch between users very nicely, and you wouldn't be able to use your own clients branding so it's it's, it's just f more fiddly and nowhere near as flexible uh, as you know uh, ingesting it into a uh, a vision mixer basically yeah yeah i think that um zoom is absolutely fantastic for a uh for getting a lot of things done very quickly and very simply with a, a very small crew or perhaps uh, people that aren't really that uh, technically up to speed so um, a lot of presenters and people that are managing their own sessions uh, can do a lot of things. You know, they can bring in people for Q&A, they can launch polls, um, you know, all, all on their own. Uh, but what the, the payoff of it being so simple uh, and relatively inexpensive for what the platform does um, is that the quality and the flexibility of those, uh, of those tools um, are fairly limited. Um, they only look the way that Zoom want them to look. Uh, if you wanted uh, an event that was that had a look to it that was entirely yours as a company, um, you would struggle to get that kind of quality out of Zoom. Um, although you would not need very many people to be able to manage it. And if a presenter is confident enough to be able to deal with multiple windows in front of them, one for the video call, one for the Q&A, one for the polls, another one for the attendees, another one for the panelists, another one for the muting buttons, another one for the camera muting buttons. If presenters are um, 
confident with being able to deliver their message and deal with all of those windows at the same time, that's fantastic. And they are designed to, to be used by one person. Um, but sometimes that's just not appropriate. Uh, sometimes there is a session where uh, a very strong message is, is to be delivered. And uh, it's our job to make sure that that is wrapped in something that is uh, as clean and as clear as possible that actually aids the message rather than uh, distracts the presenter. Yeah, and I think just, just to add to that from our perspective, I think I would always point back at the kind of message that you, you design your event first, you understand what you're trying to achieve. Somewhere down the line, you then look for a technology provider that can support that outcome. And I think in a lot of scenarios, Zoom would be perfectly acceptable. Um, I think in this, in this particular case, we're running a one session panel group here um, with some Q&A, some polling. Um, it, there's no reason why for a small single session you can't use something like Zoom. Um, once you start thinking about multiple sessions, breakout rooms, you want to do branded areas, you want to introduce speaker areas, sponsor areas, um, you want to create informal sessions, and you're trying to link them all together under a kind of yeah, a branded look and feel, something that, that feels like an event, that feels like something that people register for and pay for, then then that's where you're going beyond the limits of, say, a simple web conferencing software and more towards you know, an, an event technology. Um, I think the other point on that goes back to the hybrid scenario. So let's assume, you know, if, if you believe our theory that we are going to go back to, to running physical events in some sense, that they are going to be combined with, with a virtual element and we're going to exist in a, in a hybrid world for an extended period of time, then you know, do you want to be trying to run a Zoom into the room and trying to be take questions and answers from the remote audience on Zoom, running a separate package, an event app or something to take Q&A from the audience in the room? The data is not going to be combined. You can, there's a, you know, you're going to be running two system systems, paying for two systems, managing two systems. You're going to create a complexity. And that's really the message that, that sort of hybrid, hybrid providers are saying, that it's um, you can get both of those things. They can work in room as they have done for five years. They can work virtually as they're working now. And you can bring them together and get a, a, a tied up experience. Um, and for, for event organizers, where well, we've, we've long been talking about the importance of data and taking an offline audience and an online audience and bringing them together and learning and so on, then th this is actually a really good opportunity to look at, look at hybrid events and think about how you're going to achieve you know, the same outcomes for virtual audiences and in-room audiences. And I think you know, our belief is that that's around hybrid solutions. Um, because there, there they have those in-room elements that something like a web conferencing tool won't be able to won't be able to support. I feel like we're coming to the end of time. We've got lots more questions. I, I, I think to everyone that's asked, asked the question that hasn't been answered, we'll try to address them in a blog or a follow-up session. Um, please do get in touch with us if you're interested in anything that we've we've shown you here. If you want to talk to to the guys over at Mantis on what they can do, um, and we're always here to help. If you've got any questions around around video or the platform, um, we're happy to answer those questions individually. Hopefully, this has been useful. Um, Stephen Stewart, thanks for your help. Apologies, Pleasure. I didn't listen to your advice about Wi-Fi. I, will, uh, I need to, I need to improve my connection. But thanks everyone for for joining. Um, hopefully useful, and we'll see you at our next webinar in a couple of weeks. Thanks. Bye bye.